that your screen uh, rotation is unlocked so that you can turn sideways for video mode. Can you stop turning the lights down? <laughs> That's, it just, yeah, this is fine. Um, so when you're on, once you're in YouTube, you want to search for Blink Pop Shift. That's me. Straight through. Mm -hmm. All one word. And you'll see at the top of the search is a little circle. That's my channel. You can just click on it, and it'll bring you to my channel page. Okay. The very first video at the top of the video should be called Living Room Light Exchange. And if you click on it, and uh, you'll have to pause it because we'll want to get them started at the same time, but um, they'll probably need to load a little bit. Um, but yeah, pause it, rewind it all the way to the beginning so we can all start together. Damn. Whoa. <laughs> so two things to know about this is that... Um, my screen rotation's not on. Can you pause it and rewind it to the beginning so we can all start together? <laughs> um, so the two things to know about this is that when you turn your phone, when you're using the gyroscope in your phone to turn the video to look all around you, spherical video. And the other thing to know is that if you don't like the alignment, you can just click on it with your finger and drag it around. Not when it's Does that make sense? Huh? Not when it's paused. Not when it's paused? Not when it's paused? I, apparently. Hey, hey, you with the speaker. <laughs> um, so mine's currently buffering. Okay. Let's see. So I'm going to say once everyone's pretty much there. Okay, I'm going to say one, two, three, go. And we're going to all, when I say go, we're all going to press play at the same time. We're waiting. Okay. It's fine. Sorry, I need to get on the Wi Fi. That's fine. Is there Wi-Fi here? here? What's the password here, please? Uh, I'd love to know. Anti-prism. Anti-prism? Yes. Anti-prism. Anti Anti-prism. Anti Anti-prism. Anti-prism. Anti Anti <laughs> Wait, which, which Wi-Fi? Is it Tacos Forever now? Or is it... 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 Or is Anti-prism. If it's not working on your phone, just look at the person's phone next to you. There's like a thousand phones in this room. Need the Wi-Fi door? No, you can do it over cell. When people are generally ready. Oh, should we have sound on or off? On. Everyone should have their sound on. It doesn't have to be as loud as possible, but yeah. You should. <laughs> okay, are you ready? Yes. Okay. One, two, three, play. 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 <laughs> Hello. I am Blink Pop Shift. Hello. I am Blink Pop Shift. I make chimeras. Things in between things. You can see me in there where every day I make a new label. Or you can see me out there. The clothes are usually a dead giveaway. I am both. I am here. Usually, race, love categorization, class, gender, species. Categorization is how we differentiate objects and people. From categorization each other. is how we build groups. It tells us who we love. And what who we is a fish? And what? is a door. And then we use taxonomies, organizations of those categories, to tell us about the relationships between things. But I am both a subject and an object. I am both physical and virtual. I am both. I am here. Or maybe there. That layer that lives inside your memory. When you forget which one of me said what. Thank you. <laughs> I'd just like to point out that my husband forgot to record the whole thing. <laughs>
seconds. I thought. Is it recording? Oh yes, yeah, it it's is recording. Blinking red light. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have to get them all together. <laughs> no, it's not the blinking red light. I'm confused. So yeah, if you have questions or you want to know more, I did a thing. <laughs> 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 So, do you, do you do this? Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 um, so two years ago, I started uh, at a research group that uh, lets me do whatever I want, and do whatever I want at the time was build spherical cameras, which did not exist at the time. So it's just lots of hot glue and you know cameras melting and stuff like that. So we, my team, built some of the first spherical cameras ever. And I built like all the stitching software and everything that it takes to go from a bunch of videos to one image that you can see with your phone. Um, so then these, this is a, a Rico Theta, this is the first consumer product camera that came on the market and oh my god, it is so much better than building cameras yourself. <laughs> so much better. And stitching footage yourself and all that stuff. Um, and the reason I wanted to do this performance is because this is the first time I've been able to actually go from make a spherical video to perform it, it live in the time, like I got here at 5.30, it took me an hour and a half to make it and stitch it and do all this stuff and upload it. Um, it's the first time I've ever been able to do it that fast, um, so that's why I wanted to do it here. Um, and then also my team developed the web player that this plays on. Um, this is actually the one on YouTube, so it's a slightly different version than our open source platform, but um, yeah, we also developed that and took a year to convince Google that they should do it. <laughs> do it, come on, come on. <laughs> I'd be like, how about that? I'd just be like, come on, Google, come on. You can do it, I believe in you. Um, but yeah, so I also, I do a bunch of other um, immersive web stuff, but um, this is one of our main research sort of avenues. Can you talk more about uh, taxonomy? Yeah. Um, I am really interested in the things that are in between category. And the way that, generally, the, the way that we do knowledge creation, um, especially since science was created, is that you like, you give a thing a name and a label, and the label's super helpful because then you can look at another thing and compare it to the first thing and be like, does it get the same label? Does it not get the same label? And then how the labels interact is how you build taxonomies. Taxonomies of species, like trees of life, taxonomies like, um, you know, the Dewey Decimal System and how books are written, you know. There's all these different ways that we use taxonomy, but those taxonomies are also super limiting because if you can't build a new um, sort of bridge of knowledge, um, the taxonomy is no longer, to me at least, is no longer valid. Um, but the funny thing about taxonomies is they're very similar to mathematics in that mathematics is a self-referential system that humans built that you cannot fully complete. And there's no way to sort of get all of the errors out of mathematics, similar to the way that there's no way to get all of the errors out of any human-built taxonomical system. Um, so that's why I'm interested in them, because we like to think that they're super rigid, but actually they're just kind of like human mush that we made up. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if you would follow up on that a little more, and I will point you in the direction that I'm curious. Uh, one of the reasons why Liat and I were discussing your work was the way in which you are moving forward, or as you're describing, you're producing a certain form of knowledge uh, that has a metrics-based quality to it, but you seem to be exploring it in a way you're taking metrics-based knowledge production, but exploring it in a way that's not metrics-based. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about taxonomies, uh, and you're talking about labeling something, I'm curious your thoughts on, uh, let's say, the, the politics behind uh, the process of labeling. Like even the act of naming something defines it based off of this history, historical mm -hmm. genealogies of those things and so how that positions into yeah and and that's part of what why labeling is so interesting and i think a great a, a, a good one to discuss is like white what is white what does that mean when did the label when was the label created who and who wasn't a, a who when was the label applied to certain people and how did the label change their relationship like the community's relationships to each other like irish and 
and uh, Italian communities, for example. Like, and that's a historical moment when that label was created. And should we still be using the label? Should we use a different one? Is there like, there's all those relationships around labels. But for me, the the interesting thing is like the line between um, a real physical object and a virtual thing. So my favorite place to play in, in strange labels is like, is what you're seeing simulacra or not? And if it is simulacra, is does that does is there are there like value connections to that label? Um, and one of the pl places I play with this a lot is um, I make a lot of sculpture that's hollow skins that are paper that are based on you know like the hollow skins that. Um, like three-dimensional objects in a, in a virtual environment are essentially a hollow skin made out of polygons. So if you take the hollow skin made out of polygons idea uh, and you take the virtual label off of it and you stick a physical label onto it, what then like per percolates? That's the word. Percolates out of that um, relabeling. And then what happens when you take the thing that percolated out of that idea and reintroduce it into the virtual label by scanning the physical object and remaking it into a hollow thing made out of polygons. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like, and that's one of the reasons I did this performance is like, what is the folded thing that when you pass something back and forth between two um, strict categories, what happens when, like, what happens in the changeover? And, and especially when you do the changeover multiple times. Metaphor replacing logos. Yeah. As, as a way of thinking about that, I think, and it's a fold. Kind of a boundless vessel. Yeah. <laughs> a yeah, Klein bottle. <laughs> a Klein bottle is what I would call that object. I've never heard, of, I've never heard a Klein bottle referred to as a boundless uh, <laughs> vessel. It sounds great. <laughs> Earlier in the Institute for New Community. <laughs> Um, one thing that's interesting to me is that I think quite early on in performance with video, there's always been this challenge of oftentimes there's it's the former in front of video. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a screen behind performers and they have to kind of compete with it. And I think this is one of the first times where I've seen a uh, performer and then video in my hand. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I haven't experienced that before. And I have to admit, I am a like, pop shift YouTube channel regular. <laughs> um, I post every day. <laughs> yes, I view frequently. Um, and what I really am drawn to about the experience of looking at it on my phone is that I actually see you really close because mm -hmm. of how close you have to hold the camera. Um, so I get really close to you. Mm -hmm. And you're really far from me in this room right now. Um, and so you have to compete with this distance and the closeness that I have to my phone and to mm -hmm. you on my phone. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think about performing in the space with this object um, and how you see that kind of competition between screen and physical mm -hmm. and that maybe that dialogue or that play. Yeah. We tend to think of the most intimate interaction with an artist being in the physical room with them. Like, like, this is intimate, right? Like, we're all in the room together, and that physical interaction is very intimate, and depending on, like, how close you are to me right now. But if I can copy myself and put it on what is your most intimate object, and, like, this thing is, this thing is so meaningful to you, right? Like, this one is particularly mine, right? So it's particularly meaningful to me. It has the case I like on it, and it has, like, my, my ID and my card are, like, stuck in the back. Um, so the, that idea of, of, I guess, relabeling intimacy as like, my physical intimacy to you is less important to you than this thing. Like, I'm never going to be as intimate to a complete stranger or like a, a person I've met a few times than they are going to be with their phone. So if I can like copy myself out of the physical environment and put it into your intimate environment, I feel like that relationship is great. But then it also makes the physical part of me less intimate. Like it, it removes power from the physical um, performance almost. Which is almost also why like the sort of um, glittering echo that happens when you do it with this many people. When I practiced doing this, I only had five people. I made all my coworkers like sit on couches and like <laughs> pretend that they were here. Um, and the echo was like really precise. It was like 
one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Like, it was the same every time, but here it's like this sort of like raucous thing. So I, that I'm also interested in like, I, I can't experience it from like any individual person's um, point of view. I can only really experience it from where the camera is. And that is also a loss of intimacy and a loss of like the physical space um, losing power to the digital form. Um, but I guess there are, I, I've only done this kind of performance once, but yeah, I want to play more with like how I can interact with you intimately when this is also involved. Yeah, because I scroll your face all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. No. And I don't do that. So like this? Yeah. <laughs> Some way over here. And you don't, I, mean, I don't really do that to someone else unless they're like in bed with me. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's and it, it changes. My favorite thing about that, also maybe the most horrible thing about that, is that that changes, if you've never met me, and you have that relationship to my work, and then you meet me in the real world, it changes how close you're willing to get to me physically by like a lot. Do you think people stand closer to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially like if I go to a tech meetup or something, and like I meet a bunch of guys, and they're like, hi, I love your work, and they're like right here, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> Um, I'm just curious because it seems like there's, you know, you have to download the YouTube app. You can't just do it on YouTube. Um, and I'm wondering, and there's like a lot of like performance the participant has to like be willing to take part mm -hmm. of the whole act of like gesturing and yeah. moving around. Your body's well, involved. Right. And I'm wondering um, what, how you see like this part going, like where it's going in terms of like your relationship with your audience, um, whether it's virtual, whether it's like actually like in front of you at home. Um, um, like I'm just curious how you're gonna like, what your space is and where you think you're, like where it's heading. Yeah. You know? I think right now the thing that I've been playing with is um, like recording physic like my physical actions using, um, so um, the, the one of my coworkers by um, We've been developing this web tool where, like, you can uh, put on the Vive, which is a VR controller that lets you, like, walk around a virtual room, and you have two controllers in your hand, and lets you, like, draw little bubbles in the air, basically. And I was playing with, like, okay, well, what if I, like, do a bow over and over again, like, the same bow, and draw it out, and then, like, stand back and, like, look at it? And it takes the physical action out of my body, and it saves it in three-dimensional space. And I'm that's the kind of physical stuff I'm really interested in. But I'm also... Um, making this piece where, uh, so the, all those sculptures I described earlier, I want to install them in a room and then copy all of them virtually and stick them in another room and then have you come to my space, let you walk around the physical environment and then have you walk or, like around to the virtual environment and then put the headset on and then there's a duplicate environment but because there's no physics in there I can do whatever I want to the sculptures. I can make them huge, I can make you walk on the surfaces, like there's, I can change your relationship to the object then I can take the headset off of you, you know, switch you back to physical, have you walk back, you know, and then interact with the objects again. And like, how does your physicality relate to the object then? And like, that's, I'm really, I really want to do this. Like, I'm, it's like half double at the moment. Um, but yeah, that idea of like, like passing you back and forth between the physical and the virtual. And so like, in this instance, we're passing me back and forth. But I want to be able to pass you back and forth and see like how that really changes your relationship to a physical object that normally is just like a sculpture that you could hold like this, but then when I make it huge and you can like go inside it, well then what happens when you can hold it again? That kind of thing. So that's, I, that's where I'm going right now, that's what I'm building right now. It has, I don't know what it has to do with this performance, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I ask a question? It's in a slightly different direction, but I'm curious what immersive media it's in itself, like, means to you. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe talk about that? Already? Yeah. Um, I hate the term virtual reality. I wish it would die. <laughs> um, virtual reality is like the tech term for what I do. Uh, immersive media started with like Dionysian cult paintings where they would like paint the actions on all four walls, right? Like that's sort of where immersive media really started. Um, and it grew through, it has a really long history of like, it grew through um, 
there are the there are these uh, papal um, murals essentially that are of like garden spaces that are before people really learned how to paint perspective and it's very flat but it's immersive like you can walk inside of the painting uh, and then it grew into um, World War One German propaganda paintings essentially where you know like uh, it's called the Battle of Sedan it's a very famous painting um, where <laughs> the Germans just crushed the French in the Battle of Sudan, and they had this awesome painting. They made this really awesome, like, look how cool we are, and look at all those stupid French people in this, like, huge painting, and there's, like, smoke coming out of the floor when you're visiting it, and there's, like, they're, like, <laughs> making up battle noises under you, and so there's all this stuff. But none of that was really frame-based, right? Like, this is 30 frames a second, whereas, like, that painting is one frame forever. <laughs> so it's very, you know, it's very low frame rate. Um, but it was much higher resolution than what I get. What I get is very low resolution. It's HD, which is not. Um, so it, it, immersive media has really grown a lot over, like, centuries. And just, you know, since... I guess like the sort of Damocles, which was the one of the very first headsets that people built that could do like stereo immersion. That's when we started doing computational immersive media. And that's what I work in, but it's not as though computational immersive media just sprouted out of nothing like Oculus wants you to believe. Like actually, no, we've been building an entire art historical record of this stuff for thousands of years. Sorry, that was a rant. <laughs> like, there's history and things that you should know it. Uh, I, 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 I think it, it, this is a very good point. And I, I think there's like a, a lot of people who have um, kind of various agendas for this as being a semi nascent Mm -hmm. or at least a, a you get more money if it's new. Um, but. <laughs> I, I, like, there's, there's a lot of people within like the film world who are like, oh, well, maybe we could do some sort of feature of cinema to think with it. But uh, I mean, this is sort of kind of my first, like apart from like awkward 90s uh, <laughs> VR thing, um, of having an experience with it. And it seems much more um, kind of theatrically in line. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess uh, like, the, do you have kind of a feeling of sort of how this thing should evolve, or should oh, yeah. it be within its own, <laughs> its own sphere, or should it be? There's definitely a direct line to cinema. Um, I, for the last, like, I guess eight months, I've been writing a series called Spherical Cinematography, which takes, like, the whole canon of flat film and is like, okay, well, how do I just, like, piece all this stuff out and make it in spherical? Um, and sort of developing techniques that, that you're going to really need if, um, if you're going to make great spherical film. Um, because a lot of it's like, I'm going to stick the camera in the middle of a room and it's going to be equal distance to everything around it, which is what people do with them, but is not interesting at all. Mm -hmm. So sort of developing techniques of texture, which is what I called it in these posts. Um, oh, if you want to read any of this crap, it's on our website, lovr.com. It has epic, long treatises on all this stuff. Um, what is the website? Elevr.com, E-L-E-V-R.com. That's the blog of me and by and Andrea, the two other women on my team. Um, but yeah, like, there's definitely, there definitely needs to be cinema technique developed for this, um, but because not a lot of people are doing it, and they're not doing it in what I would consider a critical way. You end up with like Waves of Grace, which is a great documentary about a woman who survived Ebola in Liberia and is now like nursing other Ebola patients, but it's horribly shot. Like, it's so boring, and if it's not boring, it's too busy, and if it's not too busy, it's like you know, like it's completely dark and there's one tiny light thing in the frame. I'm like, well, what was the point? Like, so there's a lot of technique that needs to go into it. And I don't think there is anyone else actually writing about cinematography for this stuff. I wish there were more people focused on that. It was kind of lonely. <laughs> Let's take one more question, and then we'll open it up to okay. all of the speakers. You're back here. Uh, what, what video games have influenced your work? <gasps> Borderlands? Borderlands <laughs> 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 is the best game anybody ever has. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love... Like, okay, so Skyrim is amazing if you're going to play by yourself. But the thing I love about Borderlands is, like, it has become 
Okay, this is my husband. Um, it has become like an integral character in our marriage. Because we played all of the games together in their co-op. And like, the uh, narrative and the, like, the, I love Borderlands, it's the best. Um, <laughs> like the characterization and the sort of, I guess people would use the word